Alright, what's up guys, I hope you're doing well. James here from jamesdforesight.com. And an insider's perspective on the whole Jekyll Island meeting, right? So the creation of the Federal Reserve. So, and the insider we're explicitly talking about is Paul Warburg, right? You've seen a few, like if you look on the Federal Reserve's website, they have him in there. Um, basically saying he was a participant among amongst like six or seven other people that I don't remember off the top of my head in terms of all of them remember most of them like Henry P. Davidson um, Andrew uh, Piotz uh, maybe that's his middle name it's been a minute since I looked at him explicitly but regardless we're talking about Warburg right and kind of his own account of that meeting and he doesn't really go far in depth um, as shouldn't be surprised he even makes a footnote about it about why he didn't go so far in depth really and so basically kind of just quoting his own words so in November 1910 I being Warburg uh, was invited to join a small group of men who at Senator Aldrich's request were to take part in several days conference with him to discuss the form that the new banking bill should take and so that, if you kind of putting it in context, one in the time period, November 1910, it being Warburg and Senator Aldrich's request to join this conference, it's the meeting at Jekyll Island should be the first thing in your head, right? Knowing kind of the, the context in which it's put. And it's also kind of more explicitly stated later um, in, a few, in a few more paragraphs, basically talking about um, the Aldrich Bill, the creation of the National Reserve Association, how that would go, that sort of thing, which we know explicitly from the Aldrich Bill created on Jekyll Island, and that sort of thing. So you can kind of connect the dots that way. Um, but starting there, November 1910, right? And so basically, Warburg's opinion of Aldrich first. And so we talked a little bit in previous videos about how he didn't believe Warburg himself wasn't sure how the whole central banking question would be answered and he didn't think there was much of a chance for it until he had an explicit conversation which with Aldrich after he came back from Europe right studying the European Central Bank at the time and the person coming back from Europe being Aldrich right and Aldrich basically talked to Warburg and is like I think you're being too subtle with it we need we need to actually go for it and did a video explicitly on that kind of that little meeting between them. It was at some conference, um, forget the name of it, right? It's in the video. <laughs> and so, regardless, so the questions he asked, um, him being Aldrich now, right? So basically Warburg's talking about Aldrich and what his kind of opinion was from that whole dynamic at this conference in Jekyll Island. And so the questions he asked indicated at once that he had penetrated deeply, not only into the theory, but also into the technique of the banking problems involved. And so he basically, one of the things Warburg was surprised with was how well, we'll say well read, or and how kind of familiar Aldrich was with the banking problem at the time, the theory behind it, possible, that sort of thing. He even goes on to about how he believes Aldrich had read every single page of all of the um, the 35 volumes that were collected and published by the Mo National Monetary Commission, right? Which was that commission Aldrich put together to go study the European Bank and kind of to study the banking problem in general at the time, and kind of really get a, it was the academic footwork before the banking reform part, right? So. And another thing that surprised Warburg was, and to quote, although he was a very shrewd politician, he showed a surprising disregard for party politics in dealing with our particular problem. And he basically believed him in this respect being Aldrich that it should be a nonpartisan issue, right? However, you kind of question his motives in a little bit as comes later so on the contrary he always stressed the imperative necessity of dealing with the question on a nonpartisan basis while i being warburg had approached senator aldrich with a good deal of prejudice and suspicion i soon became convinced that the only object he had in mind was to establish in the united states as a final monument to his long service in congress the best banking system that political and economic circumstances would permit 
which kind of raises the question of legacy, right? So basically was Aldrich being kind of the Republican powerhouse at the time, uh, really just wanting to kind of invoke a large legacy in kind of American history, right? Was that kind of his main his main purpose for this as well, not necessarily just answering the banking question, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Um, that's pretty much the only words in here that kind of allude to that. And so I have to go find, like, I'll look more into Aldert specifically to kind of understand that dynamic, maybe read or listen to one of his biographies or autobiographies, whichever ones he has. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he has both because of who he is, but I haven't looked at that explicitly yet. So, with regards to the conference itself, and this is where we kind of, it's in your face, this is the Jekyll Island meeting. Um, but when the conference closed, after a week of earnest deliberation, the rough draft of what later became the Aldrich Bill had been agreed upon. And a plan had been outlined which provided for a National Reserve Association, meaning a central reserve organization with an elastic note issue based on gold and commercial paper. Right, kind of, that was really the point of the answer, answering the whole central banking question at the time, right? We talked about this explicitly. That was the whole, the inelasticity of the money supply was their argument for this reform. One of it, also the centralization of reserves. So basically you didn't have banks kind of competing for a reserve base and basically saving themselves at the expense of other banks, right? So by centralizing the kind of reserves of the country in a way, not necessarily in one central location, but in a kind of a all-encompassing system, we'll say, um, to kind of bring about the, uh, the Federal Reserve and the different region, regional reserve banks, right? So it's not like everything's just in New York, it's you have these different sections and they're all kind of related in a way, right? Basic, the centralization of reserves, but the decentralization of banking, right? Which is their argument for it. I kind of want to say that explicitly. I'm not saying the Fed isn't centralization of banking in general, but they, that was their argument and their reason for doing the, dif, the 12 district banks, right? Was the decentralization of this reserves, or I'm sorry, of banking. Um, and that there was a there was a huge I don't want to say huge fight, but there was plenty of argument about how many districts or regions they should have in the system, and with the original Federal Reserve Act explicitly saying between no more or no, I'm sorry no less than eight and no more than twelve, and it was kind of up for discretion. And then basically um, between that the. Uh, Board of Governors had the option to add banks, but when the initial committee came in to create it, they put it at the max anyway, and so that kind of negates. We'll do a separate video of that in the future, going more deep into that explicitly, because that's not really the point of this one. One of my little tangents for some reason. But anyways, uh, on this kind of National Reserve Association, right, and so he describes it as it was strictly a banker's bank with branches under the control of separate directorates having supervision supervision over the rediscount operations with member banks right and so you kind of want to say that explicitly because at first aldrich really wanted to kind of mimic the european style of central bank um but basically after this conference he kind of got we'll say converted in a way to kind of have more of what the Federal Reserve looks now. Keep in mind, the Aldrich plan is not the Federal Reserve. We'll actually go in depth and kind of juxtapose the, um, if I could speak, the Aldrich plan and the Federal Reserve Act, or at least its first iteration, because obviously there have been revisions and that sort of thing, um, which will be completely separate. But that being said, um, keeping in mind that the Aldrich plan itself actually really mimicked um, the United Reserve Bank of the United States, right? So basically Warburg's kind of thought creation, so to speak. And we did a video on that explicitly as well. And that being said, we're gonna say mimic in, because it was very similar, but it wasn't exact. And Warburg actually did not agree with the entire Aldrich plan. So it wasn't like that was entirely his creation, for lack of a better term. 
And so basically, to give a couple of examples, one of the things he disagreed with was the question of control, which he quote, or he can be quoted, I guess, saying that he thought that somewhat larger concessions uh, should have been made to government influence and representation. And then basically popping down for the whole Republican aspect of it and all they're truly kind of putting, putting his own twist on it. So the bill frankly followed the Republican doctrine of keeping the government out of keeping the government out of business, but as a starter it was encouraging beyond all expectation, right? And so yeah. Basically the whole and that was why you saw the big kind of switch between the Aldrich plan when it failed and kind of the switch to the Federal Reserve Act um, with between uh, Senator Carter Glass and I forgot his first name, but and then Senator Owens, or maybe he was a representative. Regardless, Glass and Owens, where you had kind of the Glass Owens bill, which is actually what turned into the Federal Reserve Act. Um, the major question was of control and basically like the composition of the Board of Governors and that sort of thing, uh, to where it was more of less of an emphasis on individual bankers um, and more, or even district bankers, and more on the emphasis of kind of government control specifically in like the board of governors and kind of the distribution of power within that group right and so it's really kind of differentiating between the public and private aspects of the federal reserve to where there's kind of a blending of it and kind of we'll say so the republicans wanted wanted to keep the government out of business to kind of keep the same quote um so there was more and more of an emphasis on the private aspect of it, whereas the Democrats with uh, Carter Glass and Owens wanted more of the gov. They wanted more public um, influence on it, right? And that's one, where you get kind of into the argument of how much um, there are some arguments that the government should have total control over kind of monetary policy in a way that basically you know like the Constitution gives them the Congress the the right to coin money and all that kind of stuff and basically that leads to the argument that monetary control should be in the control of the government right and which is kind of more of the route that uh, Glass and Owens took for the Federal Reserve and so that's kind of the distribution of power problem that they were trying to solve and one of the things that Warburg didn't uh, agree with because he was also one one of the mind that he or I'm sorry that the central bank wouldn't be accepted by the general populace in general um, basically the actual people in society American society and not necessarily just talking about the politicians and stuff in Congress um, but and that was mostly because of the power issue. If, if the Federal Reserve and the new kind of banking reform was going to be in the hands of private individuals and private banking, they were worried that it would basically, basically be overtaken by Wall Street. Um, and that was the main argument for that at the time. And there was actually a survey that he cited in here. If I remember off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember... Right. So it was, it was in a banking law journal, just a random thought that I have, and that basically where um, they sent out letters to state and national banks throughout the country asking them, and I quote, do you favor a central bank if not controlled by Wall Street or any monopolistic interest? And that of the total of 5,613 answers, about 60% were in the affirmative, 33% were in the negative, and 7% were undecided. Right. And basically, when one takes into consideration that the main reason given by those who answered in the negative was that they did not believe it would be possible to create a central bank which would be free from Wall Street control, um, basically, Warburg's opinion was that you could basically disregard that argument, even though um, a third of the banks surveyed basically t disagreed. But... Regardless, kind of moving on from that issue, uh, there were other things he didn't agree with, like the uh, the note issue. He wanted the actual notes that were um, created, for lack of a better term, by the Federal Reserve to be um, 
reserve money, right? See if I can get his actual thing. There was also the bond issue that we were having problems with uh, for the government, the whole 2% bond issue and the conversion and, and other little things like taxes and that sort of thing that he disagreed with. But it was mostly the question of control. But, and kind of a final aspect on the little meeting itself for Jekyll Island, right? And so the results of the conference were entirely confidential. Even the fact that there was, there had been a meeting um, was not permitted to become public. And then basically he says in a footnote that though 18 years have since gone by since he wrote this in the actual meeting itself, um, he does not feel free to give a description of this most interesting conference concerning Aldrich pledge, which Aldrich pledged all participants to secrecy. And then he understands how basically a, uh, the biographer of Aldrich, Professor uh, Nathan Wright Stevenson, is shortly publishing the biography and is going to include this information, which is like the only reason why he talked about it in here, even though not, not explicitly, right? So to conclude uh, for the last quote, uh, from then on until the final passage of the Federal Reserve Act, the generalship was in the hands of the political leaders. While the role of banking reformers was to aid the movement by educational campaigns and at the same time to do their utmost to prevent fundamental parts of the non-political plan from being disfigured by concessions born of political expediency. Right. So basically the whole Jekyll Island meeting was the turning point from the, basically the creating plans to answer the banking question and kind of fix the banking problem, reform the banking system um, of the United States in the early 1900s um, to really kind of get us into the Federal Reserve itself. After the Jekyll Island meeting was kind of the turning point to where it went from, okay, we got to fi figure out how this goes, right? basically how to answer the problem and now we have to implement it and that's when you get into the political side of things because that's how you're like okay, that's when you have to answer the questions okay now we have a plan how are we actually going to get it passed into legislation through all of the other stuff that goes on in American politics right and so that was really kind of the change and this is also shown in the fact that it was called the Aldrich plan which was another thing that they discussed at that meeting basically like we probably shouldn't call it that it should probably be because then it has that political kind of aspect to it because Aldrich's name is on it and so it's viewed as a Republican bill right or can be viewed as such and but he was hell-bent on it apparently so there's that but anyways that's pretty much Warburg's perspective um, of the whole Jekyll Island meeting in a whole or at least as he published like I said he doesn't doesn't didn't publish all of it um, because they were pledged to secrecy and all this other stuff and tell the and he almost didn't really account this part of it even though it was only like a page or two um, until he realized that the uh, it was going to be published anyway in one of Aldrich's biographies right but anyways I'm gonna leave this one here so with that being said I hope you guys have a good night and I will see you on the next one